Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Those of you back in the uh, tea line, please continue to get your tea. We are delighted to see such a crowd. We believe this is what the university should be. It should be about our sharing knowledge, debating facts, and trying to form our own educated opinions. So I congratulate all of you for being here. My name is Claudia McCullough. I am the director of the Jackson Center for Ethics and Values. We think an exciting um, place on our campus, but it's exciting because of people like you and people like Pam and Jose. It's exciting because it gives us an opportunity to get together on a beautiful afternoon like this. So thank you for helping us make the Jackson Center an exciting place. Thank you for helping us make Coastal an exciting place. Um, we have some house rules I would like to give to you. Number one house rule is no cell phones. My dear friends, if you have a cell phone that you, to which you are attached, you and your cell phone should probably leave because I really don't like cell phones. And we are taping this session and the cell phone works havoc on the tapes. So please, if you don't feel like you can be totally interested in what we're doing here, please take your chance to exit. My other house rule is please do not leave before our friends have finished their presentation. I consider that astoundingly impolite and um, unprofessional, and I know that you are neither one of those things. We um, hope that you will stay for the whole time. My, or we plan on your staying the whole time. My promise to you is this. I, I always call time after an hour. You don't have to stay here except until 5.30. And then we will take um, some time. If people need to leave, then you may leave. And maybe if some folks want to hang around, you can also do that. Another house rule is when you run out of tea, until we run out of tea, please feel free to have some more. We intend for you to be comfortable and to be um, nourished both physically and mentally. I want to thank my friend Pam Martin for doing this, my friend Jose Morales for doing this, because these folks have taught all day long. They do this as a favor for all of us. So Pam of the Department of Political Science and Jose of the Foreign Language Department, I'm going to turn it over to them. Our schedule is that each of them speaks for about 20 minutes, and then we take 20 minutes of answers and debate. So please feel free. Be thinking about your questions. I plan to enjoy it, and I hope you do too. Thank you. Good afternoon. I, I want to thank everyone for coming here, and I don't really even need a microphone, so I don't even know why I'm doing this. So, um, Thank you so much. It's such a lovely afternoon, and um, please don't feel bad about getting up to get more tea and cookies on my account. Go right ahead. Uh, I want to thank the Jackson Center. I want to thank Billy and Claudia for inviting both of us, Jose Luis and myself, here today. And I'd like to start the talk out. Um, uh, let me just check my watch. All right, Claudia. She's with all these house rules. I want to make sure I'm right. Okay. Um, uh, I'd like to start today with a few questions to the audience. These are just rhetorical. You don't have to answer them because I think this topic hits home probably for many of us, even if we're not uh, immigrants ourselves. First of all, thinking about this, who in here is a naturalized immigrant or going through the process? Who here has family who are not born in the United States? Who here has or knows someone who has non-native immigrant employees? Who here has seen non-native employees in our country or been served by them? I think by these questions alone, it states the fact that this touches all of us. The topic is of the utmost importance and relevance to our local communities as well, most particularly because even our former Myrtle Beach Mayor Mark McBride and senatorial candidate uh, for the, the past election was on CNBC one evening when I was watching it discussing a crackdown on immigration in Myrtle Beach. He made the national news because he was proposing legislation for Myrtle Beach that was even stronger than the federal law, which was extremely contentious because it looked like it was unconstitutional. 
In any event, the Carolinas, North Carolina in particular, have been designated as having the fastest growing Hispanic population in the United States. Of course, we have all heard that the Hispanic population is the largest minority now group in the United States, edging up to 12.5%, just overtaking the African American a strong, long held uh, statistic in the United States uh, Census data. And in California, minorities are now the majority. What struck me, particularly in the past few weeks, that is relevant to this talk is President Bush's trip to five Latin American countries. It made it quite clear that Latin American peoples and even their presidents that are friendly with President Bush, particularly President Uribe in Colombia, publicly criticize the United States policy on immigration, policies that they argued killed and deported in an inhumane manner their compatriots. They also made it clear that they were offended by a 700 mile long wall on the border with Mexico and that they felt like those funds could have been better spent by creating roads and social programs. So even as striking as a trip to Latin America, neighbors of ours, this, this theme is, was the number one theme which the president of course expected but was not really expecting the amount of protest in the streets for this theme. A little something, now Jose Luis is going to cover the, um, the local category, but um, just something to, to put this in perspective. Locally, Georgetown County, now from census data, has 1.6% of a Hispanic Latino population, and Horry County is 2.6%. Uh, um, in Horry County, uh, people are saying that this figure is like a 900% increase. Uh, that's like from zero <laughs> to, to uh, near 3%. That's census data now. That's not including anything that's undocumented. Um, how does that compare on a national average? Well, I mentioned to you it would be 2.6% Horry County compared to 12.5% in the United States. <laughs> Languages other than English spoken in Horry County, 5% of people in Horry uh, County uh, speak, uh, sorry, in South Carolina speak languages other than English. That's compared with 17.9% in the rest of the United States. Just a little background to sort of uh, give uh, a global and, and breadth uh, uh, to this perspective. Even Benjamin Franklin historically worried about immigration in colonial America. And he feared uh, that uh, Germans at the time might overtake British culture. Then in the mid 1800s, the Irish were scorned. Then in the late 1800s, we had the Poles, the Italians, the Russian Jews uh, uh, that were scorned at the turn of that century. Uh, there were exclusion acts passed by Congress that barred entry to criminals, prostitutes, later Japanese, Chinese, and other Asians. Uh, during that time period, we were talking about 400,000 immigrants entering the United States each year. Currently, 900,000 immigrants settle in the United States each year. 33.1 million of them, uh, 33.1 million immigrants are foreign born that live in the United States. That's 11.5% of our population. Illegally entering the United States estimates are between 300 and 500,000 a year. That's census data estimates. By the way, those statistics are very similar in the European Union as well. U.S. Census data also estimates that between 8 and 9 million uh, unregistered immigrants enter this country each year. Um, legally, 1 million people receive residency each year in the United States. That's a lot of numbers to go over, but I just want to be clear about what we're talking about today and the facts of this. Um, this is not a record high for immigration in the United States. Actually, 1907 was the record high. Uh, many people argue, oh, we've never had so much immigration. Well, we're a country that has a strong history of immigration. Interestingly enough, this was highlighted on the news the other night. I don't know if you caught it, but the immigration law, the Immigration uh, Nationality Act Amendment of 1965 was in response to Vietnam. We've been doing a lot of talking here on this campus about Vietnam and Iraq and all of those issues. Um, but what was interesting was, the, um, the, our, the United States policy on immigration is not only being criticized on the Mexican border, it's being criticized 
exercise uh, with Iraq as well. Um, most significantly, even there are some Republicans that were in office uh, during the transition after Vietnam um, uh, helping with new immigration law and accepting new Vietnamese uh, immigrants to the United States. At that time period, um, the United States was receiving more immigrants than we were even prior to that. Currently, uh, in Iraq, what the United States, uh, Iraq, and the fact that we are not accepting those in Iraq who are helping the war on terror. In a news uh, story about, uh, I think it was about a week and a half ago, it was highlighted that um, f Republican leaders are criticizing the current Bush administration for not initiating the same policies that we did after Vietnam. In other words, not accepting Iraqis who are helping the United States war on terrorism. Uh, that's just another thing to think about. It's not only a, a Hispanic or Latino issue when we talk about immigration. It's an issue of the war on terrorism as well. Current laws award immigration visas for one of three reasons. And that is either family-sponsored immigration, humanitarian refugee immigration, or preferential job skills. Um, many people don't understand that. Um, but, but we do have clear reasons for, for legal immigration in this country. Uh, three quarters of all legal immigrants are family members of current residents uh, and citizens. Before 9-11, the United States was accepting about 12 million plus or minus refugees into the United States. Those are people fleeing some type of political crisis. They're at threat in their own country. After 9-11, the United States reduced those refugees. They would be considered immigrants in, in, in the realm of this topic. Um, so after 9-11, the United States reduced the number of re refugees to only 35,000. I point this out because the United States has been highly criticized. We just recently had a guest speaker here from the United Nations High Commissioner on Refugees, Brian Gorlick. And he was mentioning to my students that the United States has been highly criticized uh, in the post, post 9-11 years, meaning, okay, we've formed homeland security, we've uh, heightened um, uh, levels, et cetera, but we haven't increased the acceptance of, of refugees in this country, particularly with all of the talk about the crisis in Sudan. The United States hasn't upped its acceptance of refugees. Okay. Um, I want to turn right now to President Bush's proposal for immigration reform to talk about what's on the political national table now. And then I'm going to talk about some different perspectives and, 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 and end my talk there. What President Bush's proposal on it was actually something that was halted before 9-11. Um, Vicente Fox was going to meet uh, with President Bush. He had met with President Bush. They were talking about considering a temporary visa program. Um, Actually, on 9-11, the House was scheduled to consider a bill to make it easier to apply for green cards in the United States. Um, that all changed post 9-11. Post 9-11, 80% of Americans think it's too easy for foreigners to enter the United States. 77% felt like the government wasn't doing enough to control its borders. Um, Post 9-11, Homeland Security Office has now subsumed what was Immigration and Naturalization Services. So now immigration, and this is important, is now being identified with the war on terror and with national security. It is definitely a change, um, uh, not only uh, organizationally, but politically and ideologically. Um, I will also point out that despite this change, uh, there are places like even Columbia, South Carolina that still receive refugees. I, want, I don't know if anyone's from Columbia, but they received Somali refugees a few years ago. So, okay, on to President Bush's proposal. He's talking about, uh, you probably heard it in his State of the Union, he's talking about immigration reform policy, and um, the first thing that he's talking about is the basic responsibility of a sovereign nation uh, for national security. So again, national security agenda item. And in that item, it's costing four point, it was costing in 2001, $4.6 billion to secure our borders. This year's fiscal year budget is $10.4 billion to secure our budget, our, our, our borders rather. Um, 
So that's a dramatic increase. That increase is contributed uh, to an increase in border control, uh, border patrol agents and administration. Um, okay, another part of President Bush's reform policy are more National Guard members sent to the southern border. Another part of that initiative uh, is a, a technological initiative. I don't know if you heard reports of this on NPR, but I happen to have, um, I know it's going to surprise some of you tech geek friends, and um, in Texas what they were trying was a new program where you could actually video webcam look at the Mexican border and check out to see if at a certain time people were crossing the border and then call your local border control agent, border <coughs> patrol, I want to say control, it sounds like pest control, sorry, border patrol agent and, um, uh, and, 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 and state, okay, on this live webcam, this, someone's coming through. Well, apparently they're saying that this was was marginally functional. Um, in comparison to last year, there were 4,600 illegal immigrants, illegal immigrants caught. Well, uh, if we're talking about 500,000 entering the country every year, I don't know that that does us much good, but that's the technological advancement that we're talking about. Um, the administration has also now um, effectively end, ended the um, catch and release for illegal immigrants. Um, that are apprehended at the borders, which means now they're creating a total of 27,500 new detention beds for those who are now picked up at the border. This has become a human rights tragedy because families are now being detained at the borders and children are being jailed. If you don't believe me, go to Human Rights Watch website and look at the jail cells with swings. It's really sad. Um, okay. Aside from that now, the Bush, and by the way, um, I'm, um, I'm going through this with my own critiques, but I want to say that the Bush administration has at least been um, uh, sh shocking maybe for some of my students to believe. I do think that the Bush administration is at least trying to work through immigration reform, which is more than we have been doing since 9-11. Okay. Um, the administration is also now um, expediting the removal of illegal immigrants. This will, uh, this has, you've probably seen arrests in the Midwest uh, with regard, this will directly impact businesses in the Grand Strand because now the Bush administration and its reform policy is also ca calling for immediate arrest at workforce places uh, and enforcement of illegal immigrants. They are saying that in 2006 there were 4,300 arrests of illegal immigrants at workplaces. This has also been very criticized because I don't know if you also saw recently on the BBC and other websites that there is a mother who uh, was taken at a work site and her children were left uh, and, and uh, they're left to be cared for by the community. So this has become another human rights uh, issue. The uh, upshot of all of this is that the Bush administration is calling for a temporary worker program, <coughs> excuse me, and um, that temporary worker program would create some type of uh, a tamper-proof identification card for guest workers. It would provide a certain time frame. They clearly state they want priority to be given to U.S. citizens first for jobs, but that they, that they believe there is an economic demand um, for a temporary work visa program. Um, this. Uh, the, the last thing I want to talk about with regard, with regard to the Bush administration's doctrine on um, reform is that the, one of their points, the last point, and I'll quote it, we must promote assimilation into our society by teaching new immigrants English and American values. This statement, which is published on USA.gov, it's, the, it's the, the White House statement, um, this statement has angered uh, Latin American uh, and, and other immigrant groups, but I've been particularly been, been looking at the Latin American news since that's my, my, more of my background, um, has angered. The word assimilation was also used by the conquistadores <laughs> um, uh, over 500 years ago, and so um, the Bush administration has been criticized for this. Very, very briefly, I will say, that a turn against immigration is nothing new to Europe. And I do want to put this in global perspective. We are not alone in this camp. There's, it's not even, uh, even North America. There's a Canada First political party. 
Uh, EU countries are struggling with the same crisis. In France, there's the National Front. In Austria, there's the Freedom Party. In the Netherlands, uh, there's another party. There's the Northern League, Northern League in Italy. There's the Danish People's Party. Um, uh, the problem also in Europe are Yugoslav refugees that has become uh, quite, uh, and, and of course Northern African, uh, Northern African immigrants as well. The European Union is looking at a harmonization policy to equalize the impacts on all of its member states. Um, the recent uh, enlargement of the European Union to Eastern European countries was also very controversial in the European Union. So. Um, while you may think that the United States stands alone uh, on fear of immigration, uh, we are not alone. It's a global issue that people uh, are, are considering and is contentious. Um, there are approaches to this, and I, I believe I only have three minutes uh, to go, so I'll, I'll, I'll run through them. But Samuel Huntington, a famous professor at Harvard University, had the cover of Foreign Policy a couple of years ago, and the title was, Jose, Can You See? And he's, he wrote a book called Clash of Civilizations, and what, and, and, and what he's arguing with regard to the United States essentially is that Hispanic immigrants have created their own civilization within the United States, and it's going to cause a clash within this country. And, and, and he's arguing, his assumption is that, um, that this country is Anglo-Christian founded, and that they are, they are not of Anglo civilization, and it will cause a clash of civilization conflict. Interestingly enough, in res regard to that, 99% of all immigrants surveyed say that it's important to speak English to them, and that 92% say that it's important to them to, st to work and stay off welfare. 93% say it's Im important to become a U.S. citizen. Um, so I wonder if Huntington's thesis is totally and entirely correct. The other important perspective to think about is, is immigration America's heritage? Uh, Columbia, South Carolina with Somali refugees, um, uh, immigrants contributing $1.43 trillion to uh, the national economy. Um, the other question and approach to think about is the economics of this issue. And I will tell you that the net fiscal cost of immigration ranges from $11 billion to $22 billion. Interestingly enough, that's, if you look at the $11 billion, close to what we're paying for border control services right now. Um, there are arguments um, with regard to economic costs, and we, looking at the local level, I'm sure Jose Luis will touch more on this, looking at the local level, having worked in the public school system, I can tell you that public school teachers are certainly concerned with the public and uh, school and hospital, I would say, health care service costs of immigration. Let me wrap it up here because I, I see I have one, one minute left. Um, many Americans fear that immigration increases risk of terrorist activity. Does it really? Can we blame 9-11 on the weak borders and immigration law of the United States? Or the United States' lack of inclusion and unwillingness to welcome the rest of the world to its table? Should economically developed countries reconsider their immigration policies to prevent terrorist attacks? Or should they make them stricter? In President Bush's last visit to our neighbors in Latin America, there were large protests against our treatment of immigrants. Even heads of state friendly with the U.S. criticized our country's immigration policy ethically. How can we call to immigrants for cheap labor and then just keep them in the shadows, denying their visible and true right to exist in our society? Can we blame disgruntled Iraqis who help us in the war on terror and then have their lives and families threatened only to be turned down for safe haven into our country? As a human being, I just cannot blame these people or their families for wanting a place to live, food, and safety for their families. Even in Ori, Georgetown counties, we are not disconnected from these issues. We truly are closer than most other places in the U.S. And as an election year draws, we must be careful to understand clearly these issues and how each candidate feels about them uh, so that we can be able to make a clear decision and statement with our vote in 2008. Thank you. Jose Luis. Thank you for being here. Um, 
I would really need more than 20 minutes just to uh, talk about my experiences and, and the local issues. Uh, so I'm mainly going to talk about my experiences and my opinions. And I invite you to um, analyze our opinions and to take what you believe will benefit on shaping your own character. I'd like to begin by saying that when I came to this country, my American dream was to achieve a higher education. I'm greatly thankful to the United States for helping me achieve my dream and providing me with so much that I would not have been able to achieve in my country of origin. But it was not easy at all. When I came to the United States, it was not by choice. My parents decided to seek a better future for their family, so we came to join many of my relatives who were already living in California, including my grandfather, who had been coming to the U.S. through the Bracero program since the 1940s. I was 15 years old, and at the time, I spoke no English. It was a very difficult transition. I left behind all of my friends, uh, my few possessions, and to a certain point, my goals. In order to come to a strange land where not only I could not understand the language, but, not, but neither the culture. All I had with me was my family and a small briefcase with some clothes. We went to live in Northern California, in a very small town near Eureka. My brother and I attended a high school that had two, only two African Americans and four Mexican Americans, but only two of the Mexican Americans knew how to speak Spanish. I was living in a different world. It seemed like everything was different from where I was coming from. All the little things, such as going to the store, became difficult tasks. I couldn't understand why, in order to participate in PE, I had to change my clothes in the locker room in front of other students who were doing the same thing. And I found very strange how the rest of the students will be naked in front of each other and they will take showers together after PE, <laughs> as if it was the most natural thing to do. In Mexico, I was a very outgoing teenager. I had many friends. I had been the treasurer of my class for three years while I was in middle school. But this abrupt change turned me into a very shy person. I learned to stay away from people and avoid the kids that used to yell, La Migra, when they passed by my side. The following year, we moved to the northern part of the Central Valley. The Hispanic population was much bigger here. Hispanics were needed to work in the fields. I made friends in my new school, and I learned that if you're part of a strong group, you can avoid being, being picked on by others. How I wish that those students from the other school were here and there to yell La Migra once again or the ones who used to call me walking bean, and I had no idea what that meant. And later on, I realized that seeking protection over racism is a strong magnet to form gangs, and that is one contributing factor to the problem with street gangs that we face in America today. This great nation has given me so much and at the same time has taught me and made me experience prejudice. One day, my mother was sweeping the sidewalk when a neighbor shot her with a BB gun just because he didn't like his pants. Let me ask you these questions. How many of you will move to a foreign country where people speak a language that you do not understand where people have different customs and traditions, where you, be, where you will be looked upon as a servant and as a le lesser human being. Please raise your hand. What will make anybody want to move to such a country? Any guesses? A better life, a better life yes. Um, being persecuted, 
will be something else. Uh, freedom, a better future. <clears throat> Most immigrants, legal and illegal, come to this country because of these reasons. It's not to be criminals and smuggle drugs, but there are criminals in, and sick people in every society. Affins along the border will not alleviate the problem. If it's ever built, it will be just a symbol that future generations will shamefully see as a new Berlin Wall. Immigrants come to the United States because of one reason. They find a job. They are needed. Who is going to work the fields if there are no illegal immigrants? I dare you to pick peaches in an orchard for just one day and see if that will be a job that you wouldn't mind doing permanently. Who's going to do the jobs that they do? Some of those jobs could be done by Americans, but not for the same pay that Mexicans and Central Americans do it for. Meaning we'll probably have to pay $5 for a single tomato. There's a very simple economics equation about supply and demand. If there is demand, there will be supply. If there is no demand, there will be no supply. If illegal immigrants find jobs in the United States, they will be here. So perhaps we should focus on who is supplying those jobs. And the same equation applies to the traffic of drugs. But we tend to always blame the, the supply when the real blame is the demand. Mexico has this same problem with weapons. In Mexico, it's illegal for citizens to possess <coughs> guns. But the US is the main supplier of illegal guns. Many times, illegal immigrants are accused of taking advantage of social services. But illegal immigrants cannot qualify for welfare or stamps or unemployment. Their children can receive a free education. But is it really free? If the employer is paying them with a paycheck, then they are paying taxes. And illegal immigrants cannot file income taxes, so they never get a tax return when they overpay, which is most of the time. And every time they purchase something, they're paying taxes too. People who fear that Hispanics will be soon the majority and will take over the United States, let me give you some numbers. Mexican, Mexico's population is about 107 million people. The Hispanic population in the United States is about 42 million people. The total population of the United States is over 300 million. More than 200 million is white. So even if all the 107 million people from Mexico move to the United States, <laughs> white people will still be the majority. <laughs> A solution to the problem of illegal immigrants has to be worked out soon so that we can focus on the more serious problems along the border, illegal drugs and the threat of terrorism. But illegal Im immigration is a great scapegoat for politicians. Social security has not been fixed. The price of health services keeps getting higher. We never found the weapons of mass destruction in Iraq, which was the real reason that many Americans supported the war in the beginning. So I don't think that politicians are in a hurry to attempt to solve the illegal immigration issue. When this problem is fin finally dealt with, we have to make sure that the stipulations are reasonable and just. As an example of unreasonable, my oldest brother, a naturalized citizens of, citizen of the United States, married an illegal immigrant from Mexico. He was told by immigration officials that in order for her to become legal in this country, she needed to go back to Mexico for two years before coming back to the United States. By this time, she was already pregnant. 
put yourself in my brother's shoes. You are a citizen of this country, and the law tells you that because you fell in love with somebody who is undocumented, your wife must leave the country with your unborn child for two years. In my brother's case, luckily, but expensively, an immigration lawyer helped him to fix everything here. One day, I drove a Salvadorian friend to see his mother in a neighborhood by South Central LA. She lived in government housing, commonly referred as the projects. The only people living here were Hispanics and African Americans. While walking in the street, I was sad to see that these races will not look at each other in the eyes. They wanted to avoid confrontation. Most of the churches I attended in California had two types of congregations, Spanish speakers and English speakers. I don't recall attending an event when these groups were mixed. Here in South Carolina, we had the opportunity to not let this happen. I attend St. James Catholic Church, and our priest, Father Rick, is always trying to get all different cultures to participate in different events. He has had success with many people. It's nice to walk to a church where people greet each other like, to, like true followers of Christ. Even in my wife's church, which I had never heard of before until I met her, people welcome everybody, no matter what their background is. I have been called twice by their preacher to translate for people who come to the church seeking help or a place to pray. In one essay from a student, he mentioned that his sister was engaged to a black man and that his father disapproved of the engagement. He wrote that his father's arguments made no sense to him, and that he was glad that his sister was happily in love. That gave me hope for future generations. I believe that education is the key to eliminate prejudice. I'm married to an African-American woman and have two beautiful children. I don't think that I will have married outside my race or see other races the way I see them today had I not given the opportunity to achieve a higher education. That's the reason I ask you to support the issue of South Carolina following in the footsteps of other states and allow undocumented students who graduate from a high school in South Carolina to be able to attend college and pay in-state tuition. If we want Hispanics to become responsible citizens, let's not deny them the opportunity to achieve a higher education. Let's not penalize them for the mistakes of their parents. Gracias.
we're video taping and we need to see that some oh, light a bit. Uh, and this exception, and I'm going to stop with that. The misconception that Congress always, the President too, always says that minorities, Hispanics, whatever, Latinos, all want jobs that the Americans won't do. And that's not right. They want to work their way up to change the, the better jobs. And how can you ask a letter speaker to speak English if he's not that educated? I'll stop there. It's not really a question. <laughs> I didn't get the very last part of the question. The education level. You came to America, you knew, you knew no English. How long did it take you to learn English? As children, uh, them, takes them very much less time. Less time. Because you're 40 years old and you come back to the border of California and it's a big list. Maybe you're not educated enough to comprehend it. And how can you force someone to speak something they don't understand? Anyway, I used to order. When I traveled to Miami 30 years ago, I had to order uh, lunch in Spanish. Uh, you know, Miami is all Spanish, not just California. Anyway, I, I will not work for them. I'm not really sure if it's a question or a question. It's a, I don't know. I, there's so many questions. <laughs> well, I. I, I... It is at best hypocritical and, and worst racist because a lot of politicians and people who talk about it, they talk about immigration as in both borders, but really what they're talking about is Mexican Americans and, and Hispanics coming in. No one's really talking about the northern border and whatnot. And what I wanted to ask is the statistics seem to back this up, and what I've heard here today seems to, you know, it be make reaffirm that in me. Why? aren't, even the politicians I've heard that aren't against building a wall and things like that, no one's really coming out against uh, undocumented. I mean, it's kind of like either people are, are for building a wall and, you know, setting fire to the border or something to keep it absolutely closed off, or they're silent. Why isn't, why aren't we hearing an opposition to this? Why aren't we hearing someone say, this has been happening for, like you said, the highest year of immigration was 1907 and things like that. Why aren't we hearing a real opposition to like I said, building a wall and things like that. Well, I, I'll, say that I'll, just, I'll just say quickly that May 1st last year, there was widespread millions of people, opposition, Hispanics themselves, as you saw everyone, I, I know if you want to do this, you're all well informed. Um, but, uh, well, I mean, like a, a mainstream politician, like why doesn't Hillary Clinton, Barack Obama, or someone, or someone especially, like you said, running for president, come out and really say this is wrong? Well, I, I will say that they, all of them have a response to immigration, I'll let Jose Luis speak, but I, I think what, what was fascinating about May 1st last year was that Hispanics themselves finally stood up and said, hey, we won't work a day, then find out what your life is like. Uh, and, and also the fact that a lot of Hispanics, um, <coughs> legal immigrants cannot vote. Temporary or permanent residents cannot vote. You can only vote if you're a citizen. Most of the, of the immigrants uh, are not citizens. And if a politician is going to come out and support them, um, they're going to lose a lot of votes. A lot of votes of the average American, not the American that achieve a college education, but the average American. I will point out, interestingly enough, um, while, while they're not voting here for US elections, in Mexico, in other Central and South American countries, you can legally vote in the United States for
for your elections in the other country, which has created some uh, some uh, political uh, controversy controversy as well. Yeah. 
that we will be importing, uh, it will be extra to, to say slaves, but uh, the very least servants. Um, but I see it as, as the only, um, the best solution at the moment for us. Um, but it is, it is a result of what you said, the supply and the issue. I agree with that totally. That, that's a result of the um, I know that Ryan and, and then in the, in the front here, uh, in relation to the comments of supply and demand, uh, is it not true that the more you know, the more that we have these these farm communities creating, it, the more that we produce, and the more our population grows, is it not true that we're going to be creating more of a job market for people anyway? I mean, the more we have. The more, the larger the population we have, the more room we have in a job market. Potentially, considering the the amount of things that we are producing for the amount of people, you know, as our population grows, we're going to need to produce more. So, why is it so unreasonable to to say that um, to allow you know immigrants, whether illegal or legal, to work in a growing job market?
terms of international labor statistics, we can all agree um, that clearly labor in the United States is, is more expensive and it's why we have an outsourcing problem. And it's clearly why we are not the main cotton producers today or to, our, we're not the main tobacco producers besides the uh, uh, <laughs> So, um, but we, we struggle with agriculture and it's, it's why we're subsidizing agriculture in this country. Um, remember, when a number of our house groups is that if you don't leave here talking about the issue, we have failed. So I hope you leave here still arguing, still discussing, and 